Uh, my, my name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress. And we have the uh, pleasure today of interviewing a Vietnam veteran. The Library of Congress has a veteran's history project and in the southwest Ohio. It's conducted by the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Brian Powers. My wife Mary happens to be our camera lady today and we're at the home of Mr. Seamers, 808 Tanner Avenue in Greendale, Indiana. <clears throat> Mr. Seamers? Yes, sir. Thank you for letting me do this interview. Okay, my pleasure. <clears throat> uh, tell us your full name, if you would. Donald C. Seamers. Donald, uh, do you go by Donald or Don? Don. Uh, do you mind if I call you Don today? That's great. Good. So Don, uh, when and where were you born? I was born uh, July 31st, 1945 in Cincinnati, Ohio. What were your parents' names? Uh, my parents were uh, Henry uh, Seamers and Almeida uh, uh, Seamers, although she did not like her first name, she went by Mitzi. Mitzi? Mitzi Seamers, yes. What was her, what was her maiden last name? Her maiden last name was Langenbahn. And uh, that kind of sounds like a Cincinnati name. That's that's a very German name. Uh huh. And my father was uh, very German also. <clears throat> Where did your folks live at the time you were born? Uh, when I was born, we lived. Uh, the address was 3014 Paul Street in uh, East Walnut Hills, or more specifically, O'Brienville in uh, Cincinnati. And that's a suburb of Cincinnati. Yeah, it's part of the city. Mm -hmm. What did your father do? Uh, my father, uh, initially when they were first married, he had three different jobs. He owned a, a paper route uh, around People's Corner. Uh, he had a wholesale uh, candy business, and he was on the board of directors of uh, a place called the Green Street Number no. 2 Building and Loan. And then uh, he sold the wholesale candy business. Uh, he sold the paper route and went exclusively to the building and loan business in the late 40s. And it became, uh, at that time, uh, they changed the name uh, to Franklin Savings and Loan uh, at that point. What, what, what had been the name? Uh, well, it was, uh, before it was Franklin, it was called the Green Street Number no. 2 Building and Loan. And they merged with the Bremen Street building and loan and became, changed the name to Franklin. Did uh, your dad's uh, wholesale candy business have a name? No. When was your dad born? Uh, he was born June 21st, 1906 in Cincinnati. So he was old enough uh, to serve uh, in the military in the First World War, was he? He was too young, yeah. and. Uh, where did he go to school? Uh, well, grade school was St. Francis Seraph uh, at Liberty and Vine Street. And high school was uh, uh, St. Mary's High School in uh, Hyde Park. St. Francis, is that still in existence? Yes, it is. How about St. Mary's? St. Mary's is not, well, it became a girls' school when they established Purcell High School as the boys' school in 1928. Um, <clears throat> which has since merged and now it's Purcell Marion High School co-ed. Okay. Um, and he went to college at Xavier University. Did he graduate? He graduated in 1929. The class consisted of 61 men. What, what degree did he have, do you remember? Uh, business. And what kind of work did he go into then? Well, uh, in addition to the to the building pay, and loan? The pay, yeah, he uh, ended up in the building and loan business and stayed in that uh, until he died. And when did he pass away? And that was August the 16th of 1968. Uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Anniversary. So he was, uh, he was only 62 only when he 62. passed away. What, uh, what was he that? had cancer. All right. Cancer of the esophagus, which right. spread. How about Mitzi, uh, your mom? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Did she go to high school? Uh, no, she didn't. She never graduated from high school. She went to secretarial school uh, at that time. And then uh, when they got married, she uh, uh, devoted herself to being a uh, you know, full-time well, homemaker and mother. Uh, when, did, when did mom and dad marry? They married uh, June the 16th, 1932. And when was mom born? She was born August the 25th, 1909. That's just the day after my birthday. Okay. So the, she was uh, 20, 23 when they got married? I got to think about that. Yeah, married, yeah I believe married. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> she went to secretary school and uh, right. When they got married, before they got married, uh, did she work? I, you know, I honestly don't know. Okay. I don't know what you, uh... So are you the first child they had? No, I'm the youngest. Uh, what other children, what siblings okay. do you have? So uh, my brother Tom uh, was, was born, born uh, July 23rd, 1933, mm -hmm. and uh, he is deceased. Uh, he died May the 26th of 2014. Uh, what was his cause of death? Uh, cancer. Have uh, any other sibling? And uh, another sister, uh, Patty, who was born April the 6th of 1936. And, Patty still living? And no, she died on March the fifteenth of nineteen ninety nine. Don't tell me she had cancer. And she had cancer. Yes. Oh, wow. My mother also um, had four other. Well, I, I was pregnant four other times, but suffered miscarriages. Hmm. Patty, uh, her given name was Patricia. Yeah, Patricia Lee. Mm -hmm. And was she married? Yes. Uh, what was her married name? Her married name was uh, Kindler, K-I-N-D-L-E-R. And what was her husband's name? Her husband's name is Jim, James. Is, is Jim still living? Yes. Did Patty and Jim have children? They had six children. Do those children, uh, for the most part, live locally? No, um, they live all over the country. <laughs> um, did Patty and Jim uh, was they did not base in Cincinnati? No, they lived in, he worked for Sears, so they lived in Cleveland, Chicago, New Jersey, back to Chicago. How about Tom? <clears throat> was Tom married? Yes. What was his wife's name? Uh, Susan. What was her maiden name? Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. Is Susan still living? Uh, no. I can't recall her day of death, but Did, it was uh, about... Tom, Tom and Sue have uh, children? They have three daughters. Are they local or are they spread out? They're all Cincinnati. What are, what, do you know their names? Their sure. Are name? uh, the three daughters? Yes. Uh, Gretchen. Okay. You want a married name? Uh, okay. Schmidt. Schmidt? Schmidt. S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Uh-huh. The next one is Stephanie. Last name? Blomer. B-L-O-E-M-E-R. And the last one? And the last one is Heidi. Last name? Last name is Walsh. W-A-L-C-H. So they've, they've kept the German names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what kind of work did Tom do? Tom was uh, in the savings and loan business his entire life. He succeeded my father at Franklin Savings and Loan. Okay. And uh, he was there till the end. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about you. Okay. Uh, you, you went to Xavier and 
When did you graduate from Xavier? No, actually, I went to, uh, I was in the seminary. I was at... Uh, oh, your dad went to Xavier. Dad went Sorry to Xavier. Sorry about that. Right. You went to seminary. What seminary did you go to? Mount St. Mary's. Here in Cincinnati? Yes. And I got my bachelor's degree there in 67. Bachelor's of what? Uh, Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. I wonder if he was there with Jim or anybody we know. Uh, <laughs> what, high, what high school did you graduate from? And the high school was St. Gregory's Seminary mm -hmm. in Mount Washington. Class of 63. 63? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, while you went to high school, uh, did you have any jobs? Oh, I, I worked during the summer. What kind of work did you do? I was a teller at Franklin Savings and Lane. <laughs> it's in the family. Yeah. Um, all right, so did you go right direct from uh, St. Gregory over to Mount St. Mary's? Yes. When did you graduate Mount St. Mary? I graduated in 67. 67. With a bachelor's degree. What did you do after graduating from Mount St. Mary's? Well, I was there one additional year of theology. Were you said you'd be a priest? Yeah. So I left there in May of 68. All right. And um, I enrolled at, uh, at Xavier, their master's uh, MBA program. And, All right. And Did you complete that? No. While I was during that first semester, I got drafted. Oh. <laughs> oh, was uh, was Tom in the military? Yes. And what was? Did he get drafted? No, he was in uh, OCS or not OCS. I take that back. ROTC. He was at ROTC at Xavier. And what branch did he go into? He went into the army. And uh, where he, did, he, where did he, he serve? He was at um, artillery training was Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then he was uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant and served at Pan Camp Pickett, Virginia, and Fort Meade, Maryland. You ever go overseas? No. And he got promoted to first lieutenant and and was discharged um, and after a two I, what was it a two year deal i I can't remember if it was two or three years, but anyway, he was in active duty for a couple of years after college so he finished at Xavier and then the military that's right and then when he got out of the military back into the savings and loan that's right all right. So you're, you're going to get an MBA at, at Xavier, but uh, that education got interrupted by uh, being drafted. That's right. Uh, where did you have to report? Well, um, Cincinnati? Or? Yeah, I reported. I got inducted here in Cincinnati on February 10th, 1969. They let me finish the semester before they took me. And, uh, and then I, I went to um, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and I went through the basic training. What did you do in basic? And How long were you there, first of all? How long were you in basic? Uh, what is that, an eight-week deal? I can't remember. It was either six weeks or eight weeks. I can't remember. Um, what kind of training did you have at Fort Dix? And then after that, um, I went immediately into advanced infantry training at Fort Dix. All right, how long did you do that? That was probably eight weeks. What was your rank at that time? I would have been, I think, a private first class after, after AIT. AIT, Advanced Infantry Adva Training? Advanced Infantry Training, yeah. And then I went to Vietnam. And I was there from July the 6th, I believe it was, of uh, 69 through September 
14th of 1970. All right, between between the time of uh, completing your AIT, did you did you get uh, leave to come back home? Yeah, I think it was a two or three week leave. <clears throat> Are you married? Yes. Well, what's your wife's name? Kathy, Catherine with a C. When did you meet Catherine? 1974. All right, well, let's, let's go back to your high school days. Did you have a girlfriend in high school? No. How about college? Did you have a no, girlfriend in college? No, can't, can't do that in the seminary. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's what I was going to be asking you. If, uh, if from an early age, uh, did you have plans of uh, joining the seminary? I don't know when my thoughts of priesthood began. Um, probably at a fairly early age, really. I, uh, well, in grade, back in grade school and high school, mm -hmm. uh, in those days, th there was a lot of religious teachers. Right. I had all nuns. And uh, so did I in high school, and uh, they were instrumental in what you were thinking about doing. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> do you remember what branch of nuns you had? Yeah, they were uh, Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. That's what Mary D'Amico was. Um, so you come home for two or three weeks. Yes. Um, where did you go from home? From home? Oh, from home, uh, went to Fort Lewis, Washington. How did you get there, train or plane? Plane. Was that a, uh, a troop transport or was that no, a commercial? It's regular commercial, yeah. How long were you at Fort Lewis? It was just a few days uh, for processing. It might have been, I don't recall, it might have only been one or two days. And then we flew to, uh, flew to uh, Saigon. Now, you're going to be over there, <clears throat> Vietnam in the jungle. <clears throat> Did you have any jungle training? Uh, well, the AIT had some component in it of uh, jungle training. Um, as it turned out, I, 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 be, I was a very fortunate. 11 Bravo is the MOS for an infantryman. Um, but anyway, I was very fortunate because not long after I got to Vietnam, there was a, uh, they were overloaded with infantry in the field and they were understaffed in the base camp. So they pulled three of us out of our company and said, you're going to work in a base camp. So I only went to, I only went to the field a few times. Um, and the infantry training uh, was was helpful though because all oh, every week or ten days or something like that you had guard duty you you were in an uh, above ground bunker on the perimeter of the base camp and you uh, you stood guard for the night. What was the name of the base camp? Camp <coughs> Camp Anari, E N A R I. I've I've got a uh, map here, <clears throat> Vietnam that another veteran gave me. There, got it. We'll let we'll let Mary get a picture. Okay. Get this in her. All right. In her view. Okay. Okay. You have the camera? I mean the map? Yeah. And you want just as close as I can get to where his finger is. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So uh, Campanari was uh, close to uh, Pleiku in the Central Highlands. Is that here? Uh, yes. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so we weren't too far from the Cam Cambodian border, um, but it was in uh, the Central Highlands, which was oh, I, I wouldn't classify it as jungle so much. It was a cooler climate, and it actually got a little chilly during the winter time. And then uh, after six months, we turned Campanari over to the South Vietnamese Army as part of President Nixon's Vietnamization program. And we moved 60 miles to the east to uh, close to a town called An Khe. And the name of the base camp there was Camp Radcliffe. And I remained there until uh, mid-September of 1970 when I was, uh, uh, when I came back to the United to the States. Now, you, when you went over there, you'd landed in Saigon. Landed in Saigon. How did you get from Saigon up to Play Coup? By troop, tra by C-130, <coughs> troop carrier, troop transport. How long were you in Saigon before you went up to base camp? Oh, uh, it was only a couple days. Yeah. Up at Play Coup. Okay. Uh, how was your base camp protected from the enemy? Well, um, around the base camp there were several rows, I'm going to say 10 or 12 rows of uh, barbed wire. Um, and, and then, as I said, uh, every night it was uh, surrounded by every, oh, maybe about every 7,500 yards there was a, a, an above ground bunker. And uh, we were assigned to guard duty at night. Uh, to keep an eye on the perimeter, uh, and we had, we were equipped with uh, Claymore mines, which were out in the barbed wire, facing out uh, with a wire and a button going into the bunker to detonate it if necessary. Um, we had starlight, uh, starlight uh, binoculars, I guess, that lit up the area if you look through them. Um, and we had M16 or M16 rifles as well. When you're on guard duty, what was your what, how many hours were you on duty? Uh, we were on duty the entire night. There were two people in each bunker, so one would sleep for a couple hours, and then you'd switch back and forth. Uh, while you're up there at, at uh, Amari, did uh, you have any enemy infiltration attempts? Uh, yeah, there were a couple. <laughs> And it was mainly happened in at On K uh, or at uh, Camp Radcliffe. We we had quite a few. Tell me something about those. Okay. Um, well, in sometime in April, it was probably late April of 1970. President Nixon decided that we were going to uh, cross the Cambodian border. You know, up until that time, Cambodia was off limits for the American military, and uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down. A good part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down uh, through Cambodia, and uh, all the, the troops and supplies and what have you would come down that way. So, uh, President Nixon decided, well, this is crazy. We we need to uh, go into Cambodia and try to stop this activity. Uh, as a result. Uh, a lot of the infantrymen that were around the base camps were deployed over to the Cambodian area and it left our base camp uh, somewhat undefended. So there were a lot of uh, mortar attacks mainly uh, that, that happened during May of 1970. It seems like we were awakened every night and had to get into the bunkers because of the mortar attacks, although I don't want to I want you to think it was terribly dangerous because if, if you got into a bunker you were safe and, and on top of that they they seem to be aiming for the helicopters which and the artillery base that was maybe I don't know 200 yards away from where our barracks was. Um, there were uh, three incursions by actual enemy troops troops within the, the they actually got into the base camp um, and they would basically run around with satchel charges throwing them around and blowing stuff up um, 
that happened two or three times. Uh, one time was a fairly close call, probably the only close call that I can, that I had personally. Uh, you know, I was just, uh, I had no weapon or anything. I just dove behind some sandbags and until it was over, hoping for the best, you know. <laughs> um, well, so, so, these so that guys, was our, so it turned out okay. So these guys get, uh, get in your base camp mm -hmm. and they're throwing these satchel charges. Who's, uh, who's trying to uh, eliminate the enemy? Well, um, that's just it. We had no weapons. Um, they, when they uh, finished with all their satchel charges, they would, try to, they would just try to get back out. And there were a couple instances where um, the sappers, we called them, they were just real little guys. Um, Vietnamese people in general are, are small people. And uh, these, these guys, they look like they were like 12 or 13 years old. They look very young, although I'm sure they were older than that. Um, <clears throat> but a couple of them blew themselves up by accident. Oh, wow. So that was kind of gruesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, they would do their business and then they would try to get back out through how the wire. Did, how did they get through the barbed wire? Crawled. Did they have to cut the barbed wire to get in? I suppose they did. I don't know that, but I suppose they did. Uh, but that happened most often there over <coughs> on K. Right. Uh, right. When the base camp was left sort of undefended by mm -hmm. because of our concentration on the Cambodian tell me about uh, tell me about your living conditions uh, at your first base camp there well we just Tonight. lived in barracks with uh, bunk beds and a a desk to the wooden barracks concrete barracks what uh, no they were wooden and you had a <clears throat> sandbags piled all around the outside about all three three four feet high maybe about waist high about waist high yeah and then uh, you had bunks in there bunk beds uh-huh would you have upper or lower I had the lower was that by choice or by assignment I don't know <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> how was it, how was the food there the food was fine um, I mean some people complained about it uh, I didn't because having come out of the seminary not too long before that, I thought you know the the army food was a lot better than the seminary <laughs> food. So I uh, I thought it was great. You know, I mean, you could, uh, I was known. Uh, I, I was the guy who never missed a meal. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh -huh. I'm there. You know, I just had a terrific appetite, and I thought the food was great. So. Well, I shouldn't say great, but it was Passable. it was good. Yeah. What, what about entertainment when you're off duty? Uh, did you have movie theater? Or did you have USO visits? Or yeah, the uh, the army uh, had some uh, bands come in once in a while. You know, would have bands from from the states. Uh, or? No, mostly from the Philippines, and also we had some from Australia. Uh, those were the two main uh, places that they came from. Just regular bands that played popular music, the, the uh, music that was popular at, at that point. Mm -hmm. How was the uh, how was the weather? Yeah, you, you got over there. Would you tell me you got over there June sixth, July sixth, July sixth, July sixth of nineteen sixty nine. By that time, uh, the Tet Offensive had already taken place, hadn't it? Yeah, that was um, actually a year and a half after the Tet. Well, let me think about that. Yeah, the Tet Offensive was January of '68, so it was a year and a half later. But as far as the weather goes, um, in the Central Highlands, it didn't get terribly hot. Uh, well, during the summer it, it, w it was pretty warm, and during the winter it would get down into the 40s at night. And then there was a monsoon season, I believe that was in the fall, when it would rain. Uh, just about every day it would rain some, mm -hmm. you know, like pop-up thunderstorms every afternoon, that type of thing. Did you get any leave while you were there at Campanari? 
Yes. Um, we were entitled, everybody was entitled to a seven day R&R, um, &R, they called it. Um, and then if you were lucky enough, you could also get a seven day leave. And if you were real lucky, you could get a three day in country R&R. &R. And I was real lucky. I got all three. Um, all at once or no, three all times? No, no, three separate okay. times, right. So tell us about what you did on those occasions. Okay, so the first one was the seven day R&R. &R. I went with uh, two other people in our company to um, Taipei, Taiwan. What'd you do with the Taipei? Oh, you just go out to eat, you go to go to bars, you celebrate your seven-day freedom. How'd you get to Taipei? <laughs> we flew. The military provided planes to uh, to Taipei. <clears throat> when you were in Taipei, were you in civilian clothes or military? Civilian. And just stayed in a regular, a regular hotel. Pretty nice compared to what you'd been in? Oh, yes. Any difficulties with the uh, the citizens on Taipei when you were there? No. Right, what's the next one? You had another. You had the next one was uh, I went to uh, Japan. And. Uh, and another seven day. -er? That was another seven days. Fly. F right. Flew. Uh, Any buddies go with you? No. That one I was by myself, although I was with other. Other. Uh, Military, uh, the military folks, but from your group, you didn't. But have. not from my group, no. <clears throat> and I spent uh, part of that time in Osaka, Japan, and uh, it was the site of the 1970 World's Fair. That was the main attraction. Uh huh. Uh, and then spent some time in um, uh, the name escapes me now, but it's an ancient. It's an ancient town. I cannot remember it with lots of pagodas and that type of thing. I cannot well, remember is, the name of it. This is 25 years after Second World War. Uh, were there any signs of uh, the war damage no. where you went to in Japan? I didn't see any, no. Did you have any interaction with the uh, Japanese people? Sure. Uh, how did they respond or react to you? They were they were gracious, very you, polite, very gracious. Were you in uh, uniform or in civilian clothes? Civilian clothes, but they knew I was military. How did they know that? Well, because the the army has uh, reception areas uh, for GI, the American GIs that are coming to visit. Okay. And um, <clears throat> no, they were they were very. The I found the Japanese people very accommodating and very. Uh, polite. In fact, I spent a very memorable night in uh, Osaka, Japan. Uh, I had gone to the World's Fair and I was trying to, f and I was getting in the subway, wa looking at the the map with the red line and the green line and the yellow line, and I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get back to my hotel. And I guess I was scratching my head, and this young man comes up and speaks English. says, can I help you out? And I said, well, I'm trying to get back to such and such a hotel. And he was trying to explain it. And then he said, well, I'll just go with you. I'll, I'll take you. <laughs> so we got on the train and we go. And it turns out he worked for Sony Corporation. And he said he studied English, but he's very frustrated because he doesn't get much of a chance to practice his English. So when he saw me, he thought, well, this is, this is my chance, you know. So, so anyway, we got to the first transfer point, and he's trying to tell me how to get on the next train, and then he said, oh, I'll just come with you again. So we got on this train, and we, so we got, uh, when we got to the destination, I said, well, you've been great. I said, can I, can I buy you a meal? Can I buy you a drink? You want to keep talking? He said, yeah, we'll do that. So we went to this area, entertainment area, I guess you would call it something like the banks that we have in Cincinnati, a lot of restaurants and bars, and we spent the entire night, uh, you know, talking. 
and he took me to this one restaurant and they were trying to teach me how to use chopsticks. <laughs> And they, <laughs> the people were bringing out the various dishes, this dish and that dish, and they're trying to show me how to do it with these top chopsticks, and they're just laughing. They just thought it was so funny that I couldn't quite get the, get the <laughs> hang of it. And, um, <laughs> and everything they brought out was very good until they brought out a raw fish. I mean, and that, the fish, there it was, the whole fish sitting on the plate staring at me. And I said, I can't do it. I just can't <laughs> eat this raw fish that's staring at me. Um, but anyway, it, it turned out to be a, a very memorable evening, a really enjoyable evening, and left me with a very positive feeling about the Japanese people. Well, what, what were you and this uh, young Japanese fellow talking about? Was he oh. asking you all about the United States? or? What, uh, well, I was asking him a lot of questions about Sony, and he's asking me about the United States, what the details were, and exactly what we talked about. That part of my memory is gone. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but it lasted several hours, and uh, we talked about, it seemed like, everything under the sun. Uh -huh. you know. Good. So then you've got uh, you've got another three there while you're there, right? <clears throat> that was um, uh, the army resort, so to speak, was a town called Vung Tau. Can you spell that? V U N G, and then another word T A U. Uh, it was just east. It was like due east of Saigon on the South China Sea coast. And it had been a French resort when it was French Indochina. But anyway, the Army's got a hotel there, and, and uh, you stay there for three days, and then they kick you out and say, go back, go back to your post. Well, the transportation within Vietnam is very hit and miss. So the Army gives you four days of travel time for a three-day in-country R&R, okay? So I made connections like that, got manifested on a flight, <coughs> excuse me, got to Vong Tau within a half a day. So when they kicked me out after three days, I had three and a half days before I really had to be back. So I got on another manifest to Saigon and I spent a couple days in Saigon <laughs> at another army hotel and, <coughs> you know, just walking around and uh, being a tourist, basically. Uh, before I had to go back. So that, that worked out. That was very good. I was very fortunate to be able to, to do that. How were you paid while you were overseas? Um, once a month. We got paid. US, U.S. money? No, MPC, Military Payment Certificates. You, you were not allowed to have greenbacks. What would you do when you were in Japan? What, how'd you spend your money? Well, they would convert them to whatever their to the yen, okay. wasn't, yeah. When, at the base where you landed in Japan, they would change your money? Can't remember where it happened, but yeah, we we flipped from uh, MPC to, uh, to the Japanese yen, or the Taiwanese, whatever money they had. Um, but yeah, we weren't allowed to, uh, it, it was uh, to control the black market, because every now and then the army would would discontinue MPCs that look like this, and you exchanged them for brand new MPCs that look different. Okay. Well, they just destroyed the black market for all the people that had the old <laughs> MPCs. Um, but anyway, we got paid once a month. I can't remember how much I got paid, a couple hundred dollars maybe. Um, what was, I, your rank, what was your rank when you uh, when you left the states to get to Saigon? Uh, probably E three, probably a PFC. And did you get any promotions while you were at Inari? Yeah, we went from E four to an E four and then to an E five. I was an E five when I uh, was discharged. <coughs> you said you may have made a couple hundred dollars a month. Mm hmm. Um, was that what rank were you then when you were making two hundred? What did I do with it? What were your What was your rank? 
Oh. It had to be E4 or E5. You send any of your money home? Yes. Uh, the the army uh, in strongly encouraged you not to spend your money in Vietnam, so they offered a savings account that paid ten percent interest. Mm -hmm. So I put I put it all in there. You know, I mean, you don't need any money. You need money maybe to buy a few things at the PX or something. But uh, you know, the army provides you with food, shelter, and clothing. You you don't need any money. <laughs> Uh -huh. So I put almost 100% of what I got into that 10% savings account. Uh, and then when I got back, I, was a, I had enough for a down payment on a, a two-family house that I bought. Good. Good. Yeah. So uh, they close up the, the camp at Nari and they move you over to Anke. Right. Uh, how long were you at Anke? Eight months. <coughs> Same duty that you had had over yes. at Anari. Yeah, we worked in the, uh, it was personnel office, personnel management office. What did that require you to do? Well, I was, my main duty, as it turned out, was uh, what they call proficiency pay or pro pay. It, uh, it paid extra money to people who were involved in uh, flying helicopters. Uh, you would administer tests, and if they passed, they qualified for proficiency pay in the aviation part of the of the operation, uh, which once again was kind of a, a little side benefit to that was that you got to take some helicopter rides. Uh, I was going to ask you, what kind of helicopters uh, did they have? Over to Anari. Did you have helicopters at that yeah. base camp there? Both Anari and, and at Radcliffe. Um, well, the workhorse, of course, was the Huey. That's the one that you see around at, uh, you know, VFWs and American Legions and all this stuff, some of them uh, in museums. That's the one you usually see. Then they had a, a small helicopter, which was only a one or two seater. Uh, was that used mostly for scouting? Well, but they had many. They had many guns on them oh, that uh, would fire. I don't know how many rounds a minute, but they were they were pretty deadly. But then the the sexiest helicopter, you might say, was the Cobra gunship, and I, I got to fly on one of those. It's a two seater. It's only about yay wide, and you got two guys, one in front, one in back. And uh, I sat up front, and the pilot took me for a ride and showed me what kind of maneuvers this thing would make. But it was, it was a nasty thing. It had rockets and miniguns, and it could put out some firepower. I want to tell you. <laughs> um, so you just went on a ride. You didn't go on a mission. Oh no, it wasn't a mission. Okay. It was just um, because I was involved in pro pay. I was able to. Take a joyride. Okay. On a Cobra gunship. Did, while you were while you were at Inari, uh did you become aware of any helicopters that were missing in action? No. How about when you moved down to NK, any helicopters missing in action? That you I, I wouldn't. I would not have knowledge of it. I'm sure there were some missing, but they didn't. We were not uh, advised of anything like that. Up at uh, up in Anari, um, did you have a medical facility? Yes. Uh, yeah, ba like a base hospital. I, I don't know if you would classify it as a hospital, but it was a, it was a medical care facility. If anything, if someone was seriously wounded, they would be transported to. Um, you know, Saigon, or maybe even out of the country, you know. Okay. But the medical facility we had was for more minor injuries. Was that, uh, a, minor tent? Injuries. Was that a tent, or was that a structure? It was a structure, yeah. How about down on K, uh, your base there? Mm -hmm. Did uh, that have a medical facility? Same thing. Mm -hmm. How was your health over there? Did you get sick or bitten by any insects or anything that made you ill? 
Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, but I'm glad you brought that up because we, uh, malaria was the main thing that you had to be concerned about. And uh, we took a, a small pill once a day that protected you against a certain type of malaria. And then once a week we took a f kind of a big pill, like a horse pill, about the size of a dime maybe. Uh, and that would protect you against another type of malaria. Um, there was one type of malaria that we had no protection against, uh, and that was cerebral malaria, which in most cases is fatal. Well, one of the, we lost a person in my company to cerebral malaria. He, uh -huh. he uh, you know, one day he was lying in his bunk, and all of a sudden he just started flailing, his arms and legs were flailing. flailing, and he was banging his head against something, you know. And, what is going on? You know. Well, it turns out he had he had contracted cerebral malaria, and they transported him to uh, the facility there, and he basically lost his mind. I mean, he uh, it just it just made mm. him go crazy, mm. and he did die. Uh, uh, yeah, he that was one death, and the, and there was one guy on guard duty who got killed when the sappers invaded one time. Those were the only two fatalities within our group uh, during that whole 14 months. What, what was your group? What, what division or platoon? Or well, it was, the, uh, it was the personnel office. All right. Yeah. But, uh, what, you were in the, uh, uh, the 4th Infantry? That's right, 4th Infantry, Infantry Division. Uh huh. <coughs> Who did the uh, who did the cooking for you at Inari? Was it well, that was or were Vietnamese. It, it was a combination of the two. They had, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the MOSs, the military occupational specialties. I don't know what the number was, uh, but anyway, they that was their specialty was cooking. So the American personnel military people, they were in charge of, of the kitchen, but they had, uh, Vietnamese people would come into the um, base camp uh, every day, <clears throat> and they worked in various jobs. Uh, they, One of them was, was in the kitchen. Some guys hired um, Vietnamese to be their maid, so to speak. They would do laundry and okay. that type of thing. They'd work in the PX, and then at night they all had to leave. And uh, they uh, were getting haircuts and stuff like that. Uh, no, that was a military person that gave haircuts. But when they left, they had they were inspected. They had men to inspect the men and women to inspect the women before they left the camp to make sure they weren't stealing, stealing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I've had some guys that were over in Vietnam tell me that uh, guy uh, Vietnamese that were cooking for them or cutting their hair in the daytime were coming back at night trying to kill them. Did you have any oh. experiences of that? No, I did not. If, uh, if you were th thinking about the period of time you were over there, what's, what's the most memorable thing that uh, you recall about being over in Vietnam? Most memorable thing, boy, it'd be hard. It'd be hard to single. I mean, the camaraderie was great. We were, you know, we're in this together. We're going to look out for one another. That that certainly was a a memorable thing. Um, the trips and seeing part of the world that I would never see otherwise would uh, was certainly there. Uh, the couple invasions within the base camp that was uh, a scary thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, who was your boss? Who, who did you report to? Uh, we had an officer. Uh, remember his name? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, 
we had an officer, a second lieutenant, or was it a first lieutenant? Might have been a first lieutenant who was in charge of the office. We also had a warrant officer who was uh, <coughs> the number two in command within the office. I do not remember his name either. Um, when, but, you were on, when you were on guard duty, mm -hmm. uh, what weapons did you have available? Um, well, there were two types of guard duty. One was the above ground bunkers, and one was uh, every so many bunkers you would have. There was a tower, tower, a guard tower that's maybe about 20 feet high or so. Which one were you in? I was in both. Okay, with the state to ground bunker, what kind of okay. weapons? Well, we had the uh, M16 rifle, and uh, and we had the uh, claymores. claymores out in the wire. Those I bet the up in the tower, would you have? In the tower, which I preferred. I like the tower better uh, <clears throat> for a couple reasons. Number one, your viewpoint is much better. You can see much better. Um, number two, the towers had M60 machine guns, which was com comforting, I'll say, to have those. Had you had, you had training? In uh, using the machine gun? Oh yeah, in, in the advanced infantry training. Okay. We, uh, we in advanced infantry training, we the M16 was the, the main weapon, of course. But that was your rifle? That was the rifle. Um, but we, we had training in the uh, 45 caliber handgun, uh, hand grenades, M60 machine gun, and 50 caliber machine gun, which was a that was a nasty piece of equipment, I tell you. I don't know if you have you ever seen the round from a 50 caliber machine gun. They're just in museums. Huge, <laughs> <laughs> they are huge, and you can you know gun somebody down that's a mile away. Um, what was was there anything else? The hand grenades. I think that was that's all I can remember as far as uh, weaponry goes. So according to the dates that you've given me, you, you were 23 when, mm -hmm. you, when you were over there. Mm -hmm. How about the age of the other fellows in your company? Were they younger or older, or about the same age as you? It was a mixture. Um, in terms of uh, when I went through the infantry training, I was probably one of the older guys. You know, I think most of them were, you know, out, just out of high school maybe they were. 18, 19, 20, mm -hmm. in that range. Uh, however, over there in the personnel office, uh, it seemed like most were college graduates. Um, and we had some that were, you know, upper 20s, mid 20s, and then a little bit younger. It was a good, it was a mixture age wise in the personnel office. How about race wise? Is there any mixture in the office? Yeah. Yeah, there were. Um, there were several African Americans. Any any difficulties back in the '60s and '70s uh, with them? No, they were great, good guys. So uh, you you uh, got out in uh, September of '70, right? Uh, how did how were you notified that you were going to be released to come home? Well, the normal tour of duty over there was 12 months, right. and I extended my tour Why? for two and a half months because if you got back to the States with 150 days left on your normal two-year term, they would release you from active duty. So I extended my tour to the 150th day so that uh, I knew that I was going to be released at Fort Lewis, Washington when I got back. How did you get back? Commercial airlines. Well, it was all it was all military people, but it was a commercial commercial flight. Flight, yeah. Remember what kind of a plane it was? Um, uh, the kind where you had three seats on either side. Was it a constellation? Seven. I couldn't tell you. Okay. You didn't know what airline it was. It was not a uh, one that you typically heard of. Okay. It was so called like Continental Airlines or something like that. Yeah. So how long were you at uh, Fort Lewis before you were discharged? Came back. It was just a few days. What did you do during that period of time? Just just get ready to get come processed. Up. You know, you're going through all these 
you know, the Army likes to put you through a process and mm -hmm. fill out a few more papers for you and what have you, and uh, final physical. And uh, the last thing that uh, that you thought you would ha would not have to put up with was the last haircut. You know, you'd get one more haircut before you left to <laughs> make sure you looked uh, decent, you know. Uh, because at that time, uh, long hair was kind of coming in for men, and uh, we, we didn't have long hair. Were you exposed to any Agent Orange while you were there? Well, when I talked to the VA people back here, they say if you were in the country, you were exposed to it, whether you know it or not. So the presumption is that yes, everyone that was there was exposed to it. Around your base camps at, at either location, uh, was there any evidence of defoliation by Agent Orange? Um, I don't know for sure about that, but uh, at Camp Radcliffe, uh, on the one on the edge of uh, of the base camp, at one point, there was a I don't know if you want to call it a big hill or a small mountain. It was maybe a thousand feet high. There was this uh, mountain which <coughs> the um, Vietnamese liked to, the, the enemy liked to hide and fire their mortars and what have you. So um, after a while they decided, well, we need to defoliate this mountain so that the hiding places are taken away. And they sent tanker truck after tanker truck after tanker truck up there and just sprayed the whole mountain and then fired flares, set it on fire. Now was that Agent Orange or was that diesel fuel? I don't know. I don't know. But they did uh, defoliate that mountain behind us. So After they did that? Who knows? Was there less uh, yes. uh, action from the enemy then? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was effective. And the other thing are the burn pits they're talking about now, because uh, the latrines were, uh, they would take 55 gallon barrels and cut them in half and put the half a barrel under each hole. <laughs> and the uh, once a day or whatever, they'd you know pull these things out. They had Vietnamese uh, young men doing this, but they'd pull the barrels out dump diesel fuel in them, set them on fire. Then stick the barrel back under the hole, you know. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's kind of, the it was, the aroma was uh, delightful. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. Jeez. Uh. Well, when you, when you first got to, uh, Saigon, when you got off the plane, did the temperature there kind of hit you in the face? Well, you know what, I I need to correct that part of it. I said we flew to Saigon. We did not fly to We flew to Cameron Bay. I'm sorry. We we entered the country through Cameron Bay. Yeah, and it was, it was warm, mm -hmm. being July. Um, and uh, you know Cameron Bay, you're you're only talking like maybe 10 to 20, 10 to 15 degrees above the equator, you know. So it's it's in a hot part of the world. The temperature hit us, yeah. And uh, but and as it turned out, there was a mortar attack at the airport not too long before we landed. Oh gee. So when we landed, they put the steps down. They said. Hurry up! Get out of here. We're <laughs> we're taking off. We're not going to stay here very long. How many were on board uh, the plane? It was a full plane load. You know, a couple hundred people, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you went to uh, all these uh, Catholic educational facilities. Uh, did you continue to follow your religion over in uh, Vietnam? As much as possible. There, w there was a chapel in, in each base camp, the Red Cliff and Inari. And uh, so, yeah, we, uh, I tried to get to Mass, you know, every Sunday. Uh, it was, uh, 
an important part of, of my life, I think, you know, at that point. Okay. Yeah. So how about communications with home while you were over there? Uh, any letters or phone calls back and forth? There was both. Um, the um, mainly letters, you know, um, but there were certain very restricted times you couldn't, you didn't get the opportunity very often to actually talk by phone to home. And there were certain restrictions on what you could say while you were on that phone. You, know, sure. you, you couldn't say where you were or what you were doing or anything. Were your letters checked uh, in any fashion to protect the security of the base camp? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think anybody did. But on the phone calls, what's interesting is that it was not, it was not like talking on a phone like we got here. It was somebody was in the middle listening, okay? And and when you were done saying what you had to say, you would say stop. And then the person in the middle would flip the switch and let the other person talk. You know? Okay. And um, so it was a little bit disjointed. But I, I'll never forget when I was uh, waiting in line to make my call, the guy in, in front of me, and you could hear what they were saying, <clears throat> he got on the phone and he says, Oh, hi, Dad. When's the last time you changed the oil on my car? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was his worry about his, about his, his car. damn car. He had to be change the oil, you know. But anyway, the the phone calls were nice, but they were fairly rare, mainly letters. Okay. So you get back to Fort Lewis, and you're there a few days, getting processed out. Mm -hmm. And your intention then was to come back home to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And how did you get back home? Plane? Commercial plane, flight. Mm -hmm. Commercial flight? Uniform or civilian clothes? Uh, it was a uniform at that time, yeah. Did you land at uh, Cincinnati Airport? Right. Uh, did you get any static from uh, people when you landed? You I did not. The terminal? No, I didn't experience anything. Mm -hmm. Had you been warned that you might have uh, adverse reaction? <laughs> there, there was some talk about that. It didn't concern me too much. Um, uh, as you probably recall, when Nixon decided to go into Cambodia, that was late April 1970, I, it was just, I think it was like May 3rd or something like that, is when the National Guard shot the kids at uh, Kent, Kent State. State University. So it was pretty obvious to us that there was a, the anti-war movement had uh, picked up some steam while we were over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't a major concern, and uh, and I never I never let it be known or broadcast that I was a military veteran for a number of years, you know, until I don't know twenty twenty five years ago when the uh, the mood seemed to change, the attitude towards veterans seemed to change, and then I right. started wearing hats like this and what have you. <laughs> Did anybody meet you at the airport? Oh yeah, my family was there. My uh, Well, my father was deceased at that point, but uh, yeah, my mother, brother, sister-in-law, uh, nieces. Good. Yeah. In reunion, daytime or nighttime? It was in the day. Good. Yeah. So you came home, uh, mm -hmm. and you said you had saved up enough money to buy a house. How long was it before you bought a house after you got home? Bought the house in early '71, or maybe it was summer. It might have been summer of '71. So. It was less than 12 months after I got back. Did you live at home during that time, or did you have an apartment? Or? No, I had an apartment. Yeah, well, I lived at home a short while, but then I, I got an apartment. Mm -hmm. How long was it before you got a job after you returned home? Well, my brother, who was president of Franklin Savings and Loan at that time, called and he said, we need help. <laughs> And I had had some experience working during the summers, right. you know. So um, 
So I said, okay, let's do it, you know. So I um, went back to Franklin and uh, I worked there for about the next 10 years, I guess it was, or no, it's more like eight years, I'd say, more like eight years. <clears throat> So you have been working there when you met Catherine. That's right. Uh, Where did you meet Catherine? We met through um, mutual classmates. A classmate of mine from high school that I had remained friends with, and uh, he married a girl who was a classmate of Kathy. And they thought, oh, these two might make a good pair. You know, so they introduced us, and uh, here we are, 49 years later. Remember where you went on your first date with her? Yeah, I do. Um, I went to um, we went to the Showboat Majestic. What was uh, that for somebody that doesn't know the area? It's a, a a floating theater on an old paddle wheeler. Old paddle wheeler on the Ohio River. And we saw the odd couple, and that was November. Well, that was November of '74. Yeah. Had you met or dated any other girls? Oh uh, yeah, <coughs> lots. <laughs> what was it about Catherine that uh, caught your fancy? The first grade teacher in a Catholic school. Um, good woman. How long did you date before you got married? A year. Where did you get married and when? Uh, we got married December of 1975. December what? December 6th. At Bellarmine Chapel at Xavier University. December 6th, the uh, day, bef day before the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, that's right. And St. Nick's. And St. Nick's, yeah, right. Uh, what, I didn't get where you, what church were you married in? Bellarmine yeah. Chapel at uh, Xavier University at XU. Down the hill from Carroll. Remember who your best man was? Yeah, Bill Hancock. Who, who was Bill? Bill was a guy that I met uh, in the, uh, when I got back from the Army, I moved into an apartment. He was in the same apartment. We somehow, we bonded quickly. Um, and uh, we're still friends to this day. In fact, we just had dinner with him a couple days ago. Uh, nice. Yeah. Old friends or best friends? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you, you you worked for about 10 years, savings and loan, then what'd you do? Then I, uh, an opportunity, we moved to Lawrenceburg then, um, because an opportunity opened up at a, at a savings and loan here in Lawrenceburg. Uh, they were looking for an, a new president, so. What was the name of that savings? Uh, Dearborn Savings Association. How long did you work there? 18 years. And what did you do? Uh, then I, I bought a um, window cleaning company. And, uh, uh, residential or commercial? Both. And uh, I owned that for 16 years. And then what? And sold it 10 years ago and retired at the age of 68. Uh, all right, uh, tell me about your family. Did uh, you and Kathy have children? We have four children. Give me their uh, names and ages. I think they're, the, are they on there? The oldest one is Jennifer. Jennifer, mm -hmm. you've got down here. She's, she's forty-seven. She's forty-seven. She mm -hmm. married? Uh, no, she was. She's divorced. Uh, what's her last One. name now? Uh, she took back Seamers. Okay. She's, she's still Seamers. Where does Jennifer live now? Denver. 
she work outside the home? Yes. She have kids? One, one grandson. One son. Um, He's 16. What's his name? Evan. Evan? Evan Seiler. S-E-I-L-E-R? S-I-L-E-R. Okay. Okay. Then a couple of years later you had Allison? Allison She's is 45. 45. And she lives in Los Angeles with her husband and two grandsons. What's her last name? Uh, Evans. And uh, she's a nurse, registered nurse. Uh, Jennifer's uh, <coughs> the is the head of the accounting department at, at the Denver Arts Center. Okay, that's her job. She's a CPA. All right. Um, Allison is a registered nurse at uh, Cedar Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. What's her husband do? He's uh, uh, works for the city of Culver, which is a suburb there of suburb. Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Yeah. And when you watch, if you watch Jeopardy and yeah. Wheel of Fortune, yeah, they're in Culver City. Okay. My wife and I watch that frequently. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> <coughs> they have two. <coughs> they have two children. And they have two children, two sons, nine and eleven. You know their names? <clears throat> um, Walter and Max. So then, after and then we Al have Allison. <clears throat> you have we a have son. A, we have a son, Mark. He's the guy that lets you in. He is uh, 40, single. What kind of work does he do? He's uh, a software developer. Works at home? He's working out of home, yeah. He's about ready to move into Over the Rhine. He has an apartment down there. <coughs> and, and your last child is the Ben? The last one is Ben. He's 34. And he's a registered nurse at UC Health, and he's engaged. He's getting married next summer. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, how about uh, how about Jennifer? Does she go to college? Yeah, she went to Loyola University in Chicago. Graduate. Graduated. And she's a CPA. You told me a CPA. Yes. How about Allison? Does she go to college. She went to University of Kentucky. And she's a nurse. And she's a nurse. She learned her nursing. She majored in biology. That's her degree. And then she went to nursing school. Where'd she go to nursing school? If you remember. It's out in L.A. Okay. How about Mark? Did he go to college? Mark went to Indiana University. And he got a bachelor's in business and a master's degree in what they call information services, computer stuff. Something that we never heard of when we yeah. were in college. <laughs> and, uh, and Ben, how about Ben? Did he go to college? Ben went to Cincinnati State and got his uh, RN from there. Uh, where's Ben live? He lives in uh, Dayton, Kentucky. Is he married? He's engaged. He's the oh, one that's he's engaged. engaged. Okay. Uh, yeah. Get married next July. <clears throat> What's his uh, fiance's name? Lindsay. You need the last name? Yeah, good. Dolman. D O L L M A N. God, I hope I got that right. <laughs> I don't know if there's an E in there or not. I, I got to clarify that. But anyway, so have you uh, have you continued with your, your uh, following your Catholic religion? Yes. And what uh, parish do you belong to now? Uh, Saint Lawrence here in Lawrenceburg. What? 
uh, did did uh, Kathy uh, work outside the home at any time uh, when the children were home or after they left? Yes, she continued to teach uh, for the most part. There were a few years off there, but um, her she taught first grade from 1972 until just a few years ago. There was there was a break in there. But her final 31 years of teaching first grade was here at St. Lawrence. Okay. Yeah. So what did, what did you guys do for entertainment? Uh, did you go on vacations or what kind of vacations did the family take? Yeah, we, we, we didn't go on vacation um, for any number of years for, for various reasons. Um, but we, a lot of our vacations were um, visiting family. You know, Kathy's from upstate New York, so we would go up there and... Uh, Where about in upstate New York? Um, the name of the town was Amsterdam. Oh, Amsterdam, yeah. New York. Sure. Okay. So and uh, uh, memory serves me. That's kind of right outside Albany, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too far from Albany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful part of the state, and we enjoyed it. We got to go to Cooperstown and for the Hall, Baseball Hall of Fame, and the Finger Lakes, and beautiful part of the country. Um, and then our parents lived in Cleveland, so we would uh, go up there. My family, uh, my sister's family was a Chicago-based family, so we'd, we'd go up there. Um, but we also went other places. We went to Florida a few times. Um, we went to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. We went to um, Myrtle Beach. Did you ever fly in a helicopter again? And Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, where our current president has a home. We went there a couple times. Have I ever flown in a helicopter again. since then? Again. <laughs> no, I have not. Um, I had the opportunity to do it a few times, and I said, no, nah, that's all right. Um, but since I've been retired, and since the kids are, of course, all been gone for many years, we've uh, we've done quite a bit of traveling the last few years, you know. We've been uh, to Europe a couple times. That was going to be my next question, what yeah. you do to keep yourself busy in retirement? Oh, um, we're still involved with the parish in uh, different ways. Um, I also belong to the uh, Knights of Columbus and the uh, local Kiwanis Club. That Those three things kind of keep us somewhat occupied. Um, but a lot of it is just, uh, you know, working the yard, cutting the grass, going out with friends, and traveling. And we how's have your, we've been health? we've been to Europe um, three times now since we've been. Where, where have you been to Europe? Uh, well, the one make that four times. We went to the Holy Land um, back in 2019, but just before the not too long before the pandemic cool. hit. Uh, but we went to the Holy Land with a group from our parish. Um, that was uh, very memorable. Uh, and we went on a Viking river cruise on the Danube River. We visited uh, Vienna and Budapest and some other places along the Danube. Um, <coughs> we went to um, Bavaria and the Bavarian southern section of Germany. Uh, that was a, a, a really great trip. There, there's an outfit, there's a, a group, uh, they're based in northern Kentucky, it's called uh, Dynamic Catholic. I don't know if you ever heard of that outfit. But they have trips, so one of the trips last summer was, uh, excuse me, was a trip to uh, uh, southern Germany, Bavaria, but the main attraction was uh, Ob a town called Oberammergau. Sure, where they have the where they have the passion place. 
So they had the Passion Play last summer, okay. it, which had been delayed a couple of years because of COVID. So we went with that group and we landed in Vienna and we worked our way up through Salzburg and eventually um, Oberammergau for the play and then ended up in Munich. And what was very significant for me was that my grandfather on my father's side <coughs> was from a town called Twistringen, Germany which is the northwestern part. Um, so when the trip to Oberammergau, that, that trip, when that was done, we didn't come back home with a group. We took a train up to Twisteringen. And they knew we were coming. My, I still have some distant relatives there. Okay. Some uh, Seamers. The Seamers chicken farm is uh, still going at 200 and some odd years now. Um, but anyway, we visited our uh, long-lost relatives nice. there, uh, stayed for a few days. They were so accommodating, so... Uh, they speak English? Gracious, yeah. Uh, they, they did pretty well, especially one of the younger, a couple of the younger folks, they spoke English very well. So we got to see, you know, a lot of places, you know, the, the church where my grandfather had his first communion and baptism and what have you, and um, <clears throat> the chicken farm, of course, and uh, visited with some, uh, some other Seamers people over there. Uh, you know, it was a great connection. Was there any, uh, uh, historically, was there any damage to that village or the farm? I don't think so. World War II? I don't think so. Did any of your uh, relatives over there serve in the German military in World War One or two? I I don't know. I mean, if they did, they're no longer around. Um, but as far as I know, there was no um, there was no damage during the war to that part of Germany. It's not a very strategic place. You know, there's nothing there to. There wasn't industrial or no industrial, or like no that. major industrial yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, we've been at this for for a good while. Uh, is there anything that you think somebody might be interested in knowing about you or your family, or your your military history, your work history that we haven't talked about? Well, um, yeah, I I think uh, one of the significant things for me was the. Uh, the uh, self-discipline that the uh, both the seminary and the military instilled in me. Uh, you learn to put up with a lot of stuff that you didn't think you could put up with, you know. Um, and that that type of self-discipline has really served me well, because you know life's got a lot of this up and down stuff, and when you're in the down part, you need that self-discipline sometimes to keep going you know you don't give up and you know you can do it because you you've had this uh, self-discipline somehow got uh, you know that drill sergeant you know yelling and screaming at you to keep going serves right. you well later on right and the other thing was that it uh, the military instilled in me a, a, a lot of self-confidence you know here I am coming out of the seminary and I'm going boom right into the into the army almost within six months <clears throat> and um, there was a lot of similarity between the seminary as far as the, re the regimented lifestyle mm -hmm. um, but what gave me self-confidence uh, in the military was that you can do a lot of stuff that you didn't think you could do and you get familiar with all these weapons and um, uh, it was just a lot of uh, self-confidence, you know. The, the the first week or two in the Army, they seem to want to tell you that you are the scum of the earth. You know, you're just the lowest thing ever. And they, you know, shave all your hair off and stick you in these goofy clothes and, and they yell at you for two weeks to tell you what a rotten person you are. And then after they've torn you down to nothing, then they start building you oh, back yeah, up again. Good. And by the time you're done, you're saying, hey, you know, <laughs> let's go get them. So well, that, that part was very good. 
When you came back to Cincinnati, yeah, uh, and before you went back to to work with the, with your brother, mm -hmm. uh, did you give any thought to going back to uh, the priesthood? No. Didn't even think about it. No. No, I, that was a a very definite decision. Mary, do you have any questions you want to ask about? One quick question. Okay. You said the middle-sized helicopter had many guns. M-I-N-I -I or M-A-N-Y? Many guns. M-I-N-I. -I. Well, when you say many guns, it was a it was a, a weapon that rotated and spit out mm -hmm. lots of ball. I don't know how many hundred rounds a, a minute it threw out. I mean, it was a a devastating weapon. Like the old Gatling gun with circular fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But they yeah. called them mini guns. Okay. But not yeah. many in effect by okay. any means. But they just were effective. Right now, the the. Huey helicopter, the one that transport, transported troops for the most part, um, usually had uh, door gunners on those. You had uh, a guy on either side with a machine M60 machine gun, um, and then the uh, then the Cobra gunship uh, was the fancy one. Okay. Yeah. My other uh, comment. Mm -hmm. I immediately picked up on the discipline from the seminary the discipline in the army and how it has formed your life. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole business of you go to breakfast, you go to lunch, you go to dinner, because they're being served. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still, I don't think I've missed too many meals in my life. I don't know why. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I like to eat, but boy, I tell you, I got to, I got to watch the calorie intake and do my exercising, or I don't know what how much I'd weigh. But <laughs> right. I try to stay in good shape. I've been blessed with my mother's genes, mm -hmm. unlike my brother and sister, because my father died of cancer also, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, well, actually, my brother was kind of a miracle man that he, he was diagnosed with cancer when he was like in his early fifties, but he kept. Mm -hmm conquering the disease and he lived in to almost his 81st birthday you know but my mother died a natural death at almost she was almost 94 years old <clears throat> and uh, was never set you know I mean she just had good genes that's a that's a blessing yeah for sure blessing we haven't talked about your uh, medals or recognition what kind of uh, medals and awards did you get uh, for the oh, military service? I, I really can't remember the official names, but it's listed there on the DD-214. Well, there's a MDSN as in Nancy, DSM as in Michael, SPS M14. Okay, we, we used M14s in the uh, basic training and uh, Apparently, I did okay on the firing range, the final test. Okay, EXP on the M16. That's expert, that's expert. an expert, yeah, on the M16. Uh huh. VSM, VCM, v, VNCAM, one C W slash O L, Aircom, Arcom, A R C O M, with first O L C. Yeah. Well, Army Commendation Medal with an oak leaf cluster. Okay. And I don't know, that first part that you read, I'm not, I think it might have been the Vietnam uh, Service Medal. It's one of the things on the... What uh, What'd you do to earn the oak leaf cluster? I don't know. I don't know what I did. <laughs> you also got a cross of gallantry with a palm. What'd you do to deserve that? I don't know what I did. I don't, I'm not sure. You got two OS, OS bars. What were overseas, those? two uh, two years overseas. Okay. It wasn't two years, but it was more than one year, so they give you two of them, I guess. Yeah. But I think most of those are probably fairly standard uh, medals and awards for people that were in Vietnam. 
When you were uh, when you're on guard duty, did you have did you ever have to fire one of your weapons uh, at the enemy? Did not. Well, look, uh, is there anything that we've brought up that you think of? No, this has been very thorough. Thank you for your service, okay. number one. You're welcome. Thank you for this interview. Yeah, no, you're welcome. I, I enjoyed doing this.